Okay, I think we are ready to start. So welcome everyone to the to this week of uh, uh, the GGI workshop, uh, New Fish from the Sky. We're very happy to kick it off with uh, Joachim Kopp, who's going to uh, be the first this week. Uh, and he will tell us about dark matter from cosmological phase transition. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to come here and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. So the topic that I want to talk about today is uh, dark matter from cosmological phase transition. So what happens or what could happen to dark matter when the universe undergoes a phase transition? So <clears throat> that's a bit off the beaten path in the field of dark matter if we define the beaten path as a uh, the, the, the well-known picture of dark matter freeze out. So this is a plot that you've probably all seen where on the horizontal axis is plotted the dark matter mass of a temperature, which is just a measure for cosmological time. And on the vertical axis, uh, we have the co-moving number density of dark matter. So we see that initially it's constant while dark matter is relativistic. Then as the universe cools below the mass of the dark matter, its abundance decreases just because uh, of Boltzmann suppression. And then at some point, interactions be between dark matter particles become so rare uh, that they cannot annihilate efficiently anymore, and the dark matter abundance at that point freezes out. Well, uh, that has been popular for a long time because of what's called the WIMP miracle, which means that the annihilation cross section uh, you get uh, when you plug in typical weak scale new physics numbers is just the observed one of order 10 to the tw minus 26 cubic centimeters per second. Now, uh, we've of course searched for this dark matter. We have this type of dark matter. We haven't found it yet, even though that there have been, has been tremendous technological pro progress, both on the direct and indirect detection front end, of course, also in collider searches. And so that's certainly not a showstopper yet, but it's perhaps a, a reason to either get worried or at least start looking for interesting alternatives. And uh, that's going to be uh, what I'm mostly going to talk about today, namely what can phase transitions in the early universe do for the dark matter abundance. <clears throat> and I'm in particular going to introduce two mechanisms of this type. Um, the first one is what we call filtered dark matter. And the second one is primordial black hole formation at phase transitions, or one mechanism for primordial black hole formation at phase transitions. Okay, so let's first start talking about what a cosmological phase transition is. Well, you all know everyday phase transitions. This is the most famous one, the one that uh, happens when water boils, and one that is actually not uh, so unconnected to the city of Florence. So this is a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, who was probably the first one to study turbulence in water from a scientific point of view. I can say that uh, it's good that, that I can give this talk here because this is where it all started. Um, this is the, the more modern way of uh, uh, talking about phase transitions. That's a phase diagram, again, for the example of water. Here, the horizontal axis is temperature. The vertical axis is pressure. And the different colored regions here are the, the three phases of water. So water, water vapor, and ice. And the lines in between indicate where the transition happens. So for instance, uh, here, at uh, roughly atmospheric pressure, 100 kilopascal, um, you have the well-known transitions at zero degree cent at zero centigrade and 100 centigrade. Now I call this an everyday phase transition. We are physicists, so our everyday life sometimes looks a bit more complicated. That is a phase transition from a physicist's everyday life. That's the phase diagram of, of QCD. For some reason, the horizontal, the vertical axis here is temperature, and the horizontal axis is the chemical potential, so the net baryon density. And it's also a phase diagram that we know much less about than we know about the phase diagram of water, obviously. We know that at low temperature, low baryon density, um, strongly interacting matter comes in the form of hadrons. But we don't really know what happens at high baryon density, where neutron stars sit, for instance. And we also don't know uh, too well what happens at uh, high temperature, low density, so at the early universe. And uh, Heavy ion colliders, for instance, are, are exploring this phase diagram to shed more light on what's going on exactly, and in particular, what the transition between the different regimes looks like. Um, now, to characterize a phase transition, uh, we use a quantity called the order parameter. 
what exactly that is can be different from transition to transition and it's also not unique but mainly a phase transition means that the system changes its macroscopic its macroscopic properties in an abrupt and significant way while it undergoes the transition and the order parameter basically has to some quantity that uh, uh, parameterizes this abrupt change so for instance for the liquid gas transition in water that could be the density for the qcd phase transition it can be the value of the quark contents that's the expectation value of uh, q left bar q right um, and depending on how the order parameter behaves we distinguish different types of phase transitions what's shown here is what we'd call in a first order phase transition so the different colored curves here show how the order parameter or the the the, the energy of the system depends on the order parameter at different temperatures. So at high temperatures, um, the energy is lowest here at this point that we arbitrarily define as the origin. Then as the temperature gets lowered, um, this potential curve develops a second minimum away from the origin with a small barrier in between. So the system has to overcome this barrier. And so what it will do is it will abruptly jump from the origin to this new minimum, which then becomes deeper and deeper. So that's what we call a first order phase transition because the order parameter changes discontinuously. Here, this is shown again, the order, para the order parameter of the state that the universe will be in as a function of the temperature. You see here an abrupt change from one value to the other. This should be contrasted with a second and higher order phase transitions where there is no barrier developing between the two minima so the universe or the system can smoothly roll down from the high temperature minimum to the low temperature one so if it's a second order transition this means that the order parameter changes continuously but its first derivative has a a, a discontinuity and uh, so a third order phase transition would be one where the first derivative where the second derivative has a discontinuity and so on so in any case there is still an abrupt change but it's smoother than in the first order phase transition here is uh, what the electroweak phase transition looks like. For the electroweak phase transition, the order parameter is the web of the Higgs. And you see it's of, this, of the smoother type. So it's actually not, it's actually infinite order phase transition, which we call a crossover. So the potential and all its derivatives are continuous, but nevertheless, uh, the system changes its properties abruptly. So here you see the uh, value of the Higgs potential at different temperatures, and you see how the true minimum then moves away from the origin and the universe indicated here by this orange dot uh, will then uh, yeah with temperature move down into the true minimum okay so much for the phase transitions primer now the question i want to talk in the main part of my talk is what happens to dark matter during such a phase transition or what could happen to dark matter during such a phase transition and I'll be particularly interested in phase transitions of the first order type. So those, are, if you wish, the most violent ones. These are the ones where the change in the system's properties are the most abrupt. So let's talk about a mechanism which we dubbed filtered dark matter and which uh, relies on exactly such a first order phase transition. <clears throat> Here is, uh, again, the picture of the boiling pot of water. And here I'm going to show you a simulation of a first order phase transition in the early universe. So what you see here is that the phase transition proceeds by the nucleation of these bubbles here. So these bubbles, this is where the universe is already in the true vacuum. Light blue is where it's still in the false vacuum. You see these bubbles expand, they collide with one another, and there, is some, uh, there are some, wave, some waves being created in the primordial plasma that then over time turn more and more turbulent. And so at this point, in the true vacuum state but the plasma is uh, still undergoing turbulent motion okay <clears throat> now let's assume that uh, dark matter particles are present during this, this this phase transition and that in fact they acquire a mass during that phase transition either they were massless before and then become massive or they had a small mass beforehand and then suddenly become very massive so that's not unusual because we know that uh, the fermions in the standard model get their mass this way. They get their mass by coupling to a scalar field. So let's assume something similar happens in the dark sector. So we have a dark matter particle chi, which is a fermion, 
and it's coupled to a uh, scalar field phi. And that scalar field um, shall now be the one that uh, undergoes an abrupt change in its value during the phase transition. That means is that in order to enter these forming bubbles in which the scalar field has a VEF, the fermions need to increase their mass by a large amount. And this means that many of them will simply not be able to make it. Many of them will simply not be able to pass into these bubbles where the true vacuum is realized and the scalar field has a large VEF. And that's the gist of the mechanism. That's the most important part of it. So we have a dark matter particle that becomes massive here. So here, down here, we have a zoom in onto one of these bubble walls. So here on the right hand side is the true vacuum where the scalar field has a VEF and the dark matter particle is rather massive. Here on the left hand side, this is the universe still in the false vacuum state where the scalar field is massless and our dark matter particle is also massless or has a relatively small mass. So if a dark matter particle wants to penetrate into the bubble, then it needs to come in with a relatively large energy because it needs to somehow make up for the mass that it, ha that it has inside the bubble. So that energy has to come from somewhere. So only the fastest dark matter particles will be able to Can make you? it in. Yes, Mike. So th does this happen? I mean, for this, you need the mass to be larger than the temperature at which you transition, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So is this like super cooled? Uh... It works best for super cool transitions, yes. I see. Um, but yeah, in general, you need, you need the mass to be heavier than, uh, than the temperature by at least a factor of 10 or so. So yeah, this is in, indeed requires super cool transitions typically. Yeah. So the same. Um, well, it, it depends on uh, how the potential of the scalar is generated. We are being agnostic about this here. You could imagine simply a Coleman-Weinberg potential. That already can lead to uh, some degree of supercooling. But it's, of course, quite possible that there's more particles to, to shape the potential. Up to this lecture, so much what the exact temperature of that sector is. So this actually works at a, at a large range of temperatures. All that, all that matters is the relative, the ratio of the mass and the temperature, except for some constraints that I'll discuss later on that then restrict the temperature after. Sorry? No coupling to the standard model. What is the, the temperature relative to the standard model? So, um, we are assuming that these particles are abundant uh, primordially, so they are, for instance, produced in the decay of the inflaton already. Um, so we assume that we start out with a thermal abundant, with a, uh, with a thermalized dark sector. And one way to achieve this, for instance, is if the scalar field will typically have a Higgs portal interaction. And that doesn't need to be super large to keep it in thermal contact with the standard model. And that's what we have in the back of our minds, even though, of course, there's other possibilities. Okay, so um, once again, particles coming in with a large momentum will have enough energy um, to get into the uh, true vacuum bubble and become massive. But since large momentum means that they are sitting on the tails of the thermal distribution, there's only very few of these particles. The majority of the particles um, will have too low momentum to get in and will be reflected. And now because of that same interaction up there, um, the dark matter particles can annihilate. At least they can annihilate here in the false vacuum phase where they are massless or nearly massless. In the true vacuum phase, that annihilation channel is closed because here it's mediated by a T-channel chi. So if chi is massive, um, that leads to some suppression. So basically, as soon as the particles get into the, the bubble, they automatically uh, freeze out. So the particles out here that are being reflected, they annihilate away efficiently, whereas the particles that have made it into the bubble, they do not annihilate efficiently anymore. Well, and here I, I already drew the diagrams, at, uh, some effective diagram that keeps the scalar in thermal contact with the standard model. That's just to, to get rid of the over density of phi that we produce. And that can be realized, for instance, uh, through the Higgs portal. Okay. So because only a small fraction of the dark matter particles gets into those bubbles, um, we observe a relatively small dark matter abundance today, right? Typically, you need to decrease 
the number density of the, the co-moving number density of dark matter by something like 10 orders of magnitude compared to the equilibrium abundance of a relativistic species to explain the dark matter abundance today. And that's uh, how, how this is achieved. And yeah, the particles that are reflected, I already said that they remain outside and annihilate away efficiently. Um, okay, here is a, a more detailed sketch of what this looks like in phase space. So here we show here that the, this gray band at the center here, that's the wall of the bubble. The bubble is moving to the left. So here on the right hand side is again the true vacuum. On the left hand side is the false vacuum. The horizontal axis is again sp the spatial distance. But vertical axis is now the momentum. So here in the center of the plot, these are the low momentum particles and the gray contours here show their trajectories. So they come in with a certain momentum, are reflected and then go back out. Whereas the particles that come in with a large momentum, they are able to make it into the bubble. They lose some momentum because some of their energy gets converted uh, into mass, but they are able to make it in. And the shading here uh, shows the density relative to the equilibrium density. So you see that the bubble wall here pushes an over density ahead of it and that then relatively quickly annihilates away. Uh, so doesn't that also slow the, the bubble? Uh, the fact that it has in principle it does yes it does slow the bubble wall. So we've anyway been working with non-relativistic bubble walls here. Turns out that the effect is relatively insensitive uh, to the precise velocity of the bubble wall. Therefore we've not taken this slowdown uh, into account. Okay, in the interest of time, I think I'm not going to go through the through the calculation. Yeah, but basically what we are doing is we are solving a Boltzmann equation, right? We have we have our phase space, um, which depends on a spatial coordinate and a momentum coordinate. So we have a system of coupled Boltzmann equations. That's a partial differential equation, and then you do some tricks to solve it. And basically, what solving it then means is. Uh, that you solve it along each of these trajectories and then stitch together the solutions. It's called the method of characteristics, um, but I will skip over it here. Um, and the, the main assumptions we make solving it is basically that we can restrict ourselves to those two space, to those two phase space dimensions, the uh, spatial coordinate and one momentum direction. So we assume a translational invariance along the bubble wall, which is typically a good approximation, except in the very early stages of bubble expansion. Okay, now let me show you the parameter space. Um, this is what I meant by saying that we are relatively insensitive to the temperature. So here I show on the horizontal axis, the dark matter mass. And for the purposes of this plot, I've assumed that the ratio between the mass and the temperature is a factor of 40. So if you read off the dark matter mass here, you automatically get also the temperature. Um, roughly, there, there's, there's, a, there's a small a logarithmic dependence to get the right abundance, but it's always order factor of 40, 30 or so. On the vertical axis, we have plotted this as a function of the dark matter nucleon cross section. Here is all the usual curves from direct detection experiments. Here is the neutrino floor. And the blue regions here show where the mechanism works. And what's interesting is, um, first of all, it can at least part of this parameter space can be probed by direct detection experiments. So it reaches above the neutrino floor. And what's also interesting is, it reaches out to relatively high dark matter masses. So this is a way of producing the correct abundance of dark matter in the PEV to EEV mass range, where for instance, a thermal freeze out wouldn't work because it would be above the greased Kamionkowski bound, so above parity constraint. We don't have that problem here. Um, you may also notice that there is two disjoint regions here. And this basically has to do with the fact um, that, the whole, that the whole dark sector stays in contact uh, with the standard model sector. Um, this has to, we are assuming that this goes through the Higgs portal and then different Higgs, Higgs uh, decay channels open up or close. And this is the reason for, for this rather complicated structure here. Okay, yeah. Um, so what are you assuming for the cars into the standard model? Uh, the Higgs portal. So we have uh, one coefficient. Sorry? We have a coefficient one. What do you put? Uh, no, we, we scan over this. So what, what you're not seeing here is, is several parameters that we scan over uh -huh. here. So this is like a projection of a multidimensional parameter space onto this plane. So what, uh, what the blue regions here mean that there is one acceptable value for the Yukawa coupling, for the Higgs portal coupling, 
uh, for which we can get the correct relic abundance. But it seems to me that the uh, direct detection cost, uh, cross section depends entirely on the exporter, and the rest is completely decoupled. So, what um, is what you get, no? Well, it depends on the Higgs portal coupling and on the Yukawa coupling. It's correct that direct detection is mediated through the scalar. Hmm. And of course, the scalar couplings to the standard model are fixed. Then there is the Higgs portal coupling that mixes the two scalars. And there's also the coupling of the dark scalar to the actual dark matter particle. So the direct detection cross section depends on those two parameters mm -hmm. and the mass, of course. Okay. So I don't understand how this can be. You can make a prediction. Hmm? Um, it does, but there is, for instance, a constraint that it can't be larger than four pi. For for instance, so the, the upper edges here, um, I don't remember which ones which, but these the upper edges of this region are typically given by some coupling reaching a value of square root four pi. So this is so, B. Is that correct? Oh. Sorry, is this the most optimistic it can it can be? Essentially, scanning yes. the other yes. parameters yeah. to yeah. get the most optimistic point. Yeah. 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 Okay, scan. <laughs> so when you compute the dark matter balance, what is your assumption of on the Thickness of the wall. Do you do you work in a thin wall limit or thick thick wall limit? Uh, relatively thin walls. So our wall thickness is typically of order the of order the inverse temperature. Um, but then again, there is not a very strong dependence on this. So if it's ten times the inverse temperature, uh, the results will be practically unchanged, because the the main effect is whether or not a particle has enough energy to get through the bubble wall or not, and that depends on the mass gain of the particle, not so much on the exact uh, thickness and shape of the wall. Uh, I thought in the limit where the wall is very thick, there can be some exponential suppression. It's essentially because in, in your setup, the momentum change inside and outside the, outside the wall. And, but that is consistent with the momentum conservation because this translational invariance is broken by the wall profile. And in the limit where wall profile is thick, you have an approximate translational invariance so that uh, the process with momentum change is exponentially suppressed. So are you referring to the fact that the particle will pick up some momentum from the wall in the process? Uh, so, so essentially, are, yes. Yeah, yeah because yes. I, I, so we, are, we are working in the rest frame of the wall, so, but, but I think that that's what you're referring to. In the, in the rest frame of the wall, this would then correspond to a yeah, apparent non-conservation of momentum. However, for these relatively small walls that we are considering here, that's unimportant. If the wall is faster, then this will become an issue, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. What's the wall velocity? Why, why is it slow? I mean, why is the wall is it moving slowly? If it's uh, not, then the wall frame the kinetic energy of those uh, would it be very large, right? So one reason we considered small, uh, slow walls is because we 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 know that the fact that dark matter particles are being reflected causes some friction. Um, but of course, once again, the precise velocity of the wall depends on uh, the details of the phase transition. If you have a phase transition with very large latent heat release, then of course the wall can still be relativistic. Um, I think it was mostly a choice on our part to focus on that part of the parameter space. Um, also, that was numerically simpler. And moreover, um, we had in mind using this also for barrier genesis. We are currently uh, working uh, on this in the, on, the, on the final stages of a barrier genesis project in this context. And there are also slow walls are typically uh, a bit favored. I see there's a question from Jan on the Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Um, so you, you want to impose some super cooling because you want uh, dark matter to have already frozen out at the time of the nucleation. But then how can you make sure that the, the bubble wall velocity will not be too fast, such that there is no large Lorentz factor that uh, allow actually the particle to enter the wall? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question very well. So the question is about- um... I, can repeat it. I can repeat it, I can make it simpler. 
So you need to impose some super cooling, but you also want a slow moving bubble wall. Yes. The first is because you want dark matter to have frozen out. And the second is because you want particle to, get, to be reflected. So the first one, the, the first condition imposes a, a lot of super cooling and the second one imposes a slow moving bubble wall. But are, are the two conditions not incompatible? You mean how, how, how those two can happen simultaneously, super cooling exactly. but slow bubble walls? Exactly. Um, well, once again, that is something that will depend on the exact shape of the potential. So the type of potential that we had in mind was a Coleman-Weinberg-like potential where there is a relatively broad barrier between the true and false vacua, um, but the true vacuum is, is still relatively shallow compared to the false vacuum. So there's not a, a terribly large amount of latent heat release, um, but nevertheless, um, it's hard for the system to overcome the barrier simply because the barrier is so broad. Okay. So that's, that, that's how, how we... Yeah, so, in fact, why do you need the super cooling at all here? You just need the mass to be bigger than a critical temperature. Well, we need, we need, we need, we need a large order parameter. So, we need um, the VEF that the scalar field acquires to be larger than the temperature of the phase transition. And that is something that can happen in a super cooled phase transition. But then you have a relativistic bubble walls. I mean, that's. Uh... Is that really always the case? I mean, there's so many, there, there's different things that can slow down the bubble wall. One is particles being reflected. And... Well, may, maybe I'm not using the same definition of supercooling. To me, supercooling simply meant that the phase transition happens um, uh, a certain amount of time after the critical temperature, so that the nucleation temperature is significantly below the critical temperature, where the critical temperature is the temperature at which the true and false vacua are equal. And uh, where well, the nucleation temperature is where you, nucleate one, where you nucleate on average one bubble per Hubble volume. Um, but I, I don't see an, an in principle reason why this always has to lead to large bubble walls. For no, instance, no. you could imagine a, uh, a a potential that depends relatively weakly on temperature. So at some point it reaches the critical temperature where the two minima are equal, but there's a broad, a broad or tall barrier between them. So at that point, you cannot nucleate bubbles yet. And then the true minimum slowly, very slowly moves down. And at some point, um, the uh, you just your universe is just expanding slowly enough that the tunneling probability through the barrier becomes such that you can nucleate one bubble per Hubble volume on average. No, but, but, at that, but at that point, it's not necessary yet that the, the true vacuum is particularly deep, right? It's only necessary that you have enough time. You can either deepen the true vacuum to increase the tunneling probability, or you can simply wait. No, but but you do have a mass difference. The mass difference is much bigger. So it seems to me that it's, it, it's going to be tuned if your mass difference is large, whereas the vacuum energy difference is, is small between the two, the two vacua. So, I mean, the mass difference should also, at the end of the day, come in maybe with one loop factor to, to a vacuum energy difference. You mean the mass difference of the dark matter particle inside yes. and outside? Yeah. If that's bigger than the temperature, mm -hmm. I would expect naive that, that the vacuum energy will also be bigger than the temperature. I mean, maybe it's not, gen maybe you can find a way out of this, but I think generically this, this should be- but For a generic polynomial potential, that is certainly the case, yes. So that that's, that's, was clear from the start that this is not a simple polynomial potential. So it has to be a, a somewhat more complicated uh, but, animal. Sorry, I, 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 what, why, what is wrong with having, having relativistic uh, velocities? Um, I think for, for, a relative, for a highly relativistic velocity, um, the filtering is just not as efficient because that means if you have, if we wall is moving at, at a large gamma factor, then because of the large gamma factor, um, it's easy for particles to penetrate into the wall, even if they start out with a small oh, momentum. You can look at it in the rest frame of the bubble wall. So if your bubble wall is at rest, but in the lab frame has a large gamma factor, then this effectively means that your population of dark matter particles is now moving at a very large gamma factor. So that means simply because they are so highly boosted, most of them will be able to penetrate into the bubble. And that then makes the mechanism less efficient. 
if we are talking about gamma factors of order one or two or three or so, that's not an issue yet. But if we are talking about gamma factors of 100 or 1,000, then this would basically mean uh, that every particle will be able to go into the bubble and you'd vastly over predict uh, the dark matter. But I don't see today. a priori why, why this shouldn't, uh, I mean, you're saying the, the particles are now much faster, but also you can increase the, the, the mass difference. And I don't see a priori why one should win over the other. You can increase the mass difference, of course, but that then means again that your, um, the ratio between your mass and your temperature should still be much larger than the gamma factor of your wall. Yeah, that's true. So and th that means that you're then really talking about extremely large mass differences. And at some point we started feeling uncomfortable about this. Okay, sure. But th th yeah. that was the thinking uh, that went into this. Sure. What happened to the standard model degrees of freedom here? Because there is a temperature the bath model, you have a link to the to the to the Higgs. So as the wall moves to standard model particles, what happens to it? So in principle, of course, the temperature of the standard model particles is slightly affected by the fact that some energy of the from the dark sector is being dumped into the standard model. However, we don't expect this to be a very large effect because we are thinking here about the situation above the electroweak phase transition where we have maybe 100 uh, uh, standard model degrees of freedom. And now we are uh, getting rid of four dark sector degrees of freedom if chi is a Dirac fermion. And basically the energy of those four degrees of freedom from the dark sector gets distributed among all the 100 degrees of freedom in the standard model. So the change to the standard model temperature should not be such a large effect here. But, but Um, if the only coupling that the dark sector has to the standard model is some smallish Higgs portal coupling or so, then I don't think that the bubble wall will feel the standard model degrees of freedom so strongly. If this was, for instance, uh, the electroweak phase transition, so then there would be more effect. Then first of all, also the standard model particles would, uh, some standard model particles would gain a mass upon entering the bubble. Then there would be the possibility of transition radiation as particles cross the bubble wall. So then uh, things would become more complicated, but we've deliberately kept our dark sector relatively decoupled um, to, to yeah, isolate the, the new mechanism. Yeah, that's, so, like the, that's like the extreme points, yes. But even then, um, what this just means then is that there is large mixing between the Higgs and the standard model uh, particles. So at those points, I would say our calculations become only marginally valid because, uh, well, then for instance, well, obviously the, the, the Higgs cannot have uh, arbitrarily large mixings with a new sec a dark sector scalar. Um, okay, so what uh, yes, I can quickly uh, open the paper and show you that. <laughs> um, just a moment. Um, dun -dun. Okay, so th this is the terms in the Lagrangian that we require um, for the, for the uh, general mechanism to work. So we require the coupling of the scalar to the, to the fermion and we require the Higgs portal coupling. We are deliberately being agnostic about the potential. So we are saying what properties the potential has to satisfy, but we are being agnostic about what the precise shape of the potential is that realizes this. And also the Higgs potential in all of uh, well, you mean that, that, that V of phi should also depend on the Higgs? Yes, in principle, yes. But yeah, that, that, that's what I mean. In principle, the scalar potential is a function of phi and H, but we assume that we are still in a situation where the Higgs, where the, the thermal corrects to the Higgs part of the potential 
are so large that the Higgs wave stays at zero throughout. A typically above electroweak. The, ma the main reason it has to be above electroweak is that um, when, our, when the reflected chi particles annihilate, um, they produce scalars, dark sector scalars, and the dark sector scalars, we want them to decay away. We want them to, to go to the standard model degrees of freedom. And below the electroweak scale, that has to go through an off-shell Higgs, which greatly suppresses this interaction rate. And therefore, uh, we, we, it, the mechanism essentially only works if the phase transition temperature is well above the electroweak phase transition. And that means that the thermal corrections to the standard model Higgs put large. Thank you. Okay. Now I see that I'm basically out of time, right? Um, yeah, which, is, which is fine. Um, yeah, how, how, how much longer do you need? It depends on how much more I'm, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there were tons of questions. You can continue. I will continue for, for at like, least 10 I will minutes. continue for two or three minutes just to give you the, the to, 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 to spin the thought further, and then uh, I'll shut up. So, and the direction in which I want to spin this further is remember that I've uh, talked a lot about the dark matter particles that are reflected. Wall. Now, I've always argued that they are supposed to annihilate away quickly. But now let's assume what happens if they do not uh, annihilate away quickly. In this case, they will push, they will be pushed ahead of the bubble wall. And then the question we asked ourselves is can their density become large enough um, to collapse into a black hole? So basically, can, the, can their uh, uh, integrated mass in a certain region of phase space become uh, uh, larger than the inverse Schwarzschild radius? And the answer is yes, under certain conditions. And I'm going to tell you about those conditions, and then we can discuss on how extreme or not extreme they are. So the basic picture is um, we are now looking at a relatively late stage of the phase transition. So let's assume um, that all around the universe is already in the true vacuum state. But there is a small region, or maybe not so small region, we'll see that. There's a region in which it is still in the false vacuum state. There are particles in this false vacuum uh, region that cannot get into the true vacuum region because they are too heavy, so most of them are reflected away. And so they have to stay in here. And as these surrounding bubbles here expand, they get compressed further and further. And at some point, this region here will become smaller than its own Schwarzschild radius. And that means uh, a horizon forms. And so we end up with a black hole. Um, now, no, chi is still symmetric, can still be symmetric. We don't, we assume no longer here that chi is necessarily the dark matter particle. That is now just some dark sector fermion. The Lagrangian remains the same, but we are no longer requiring that this is dark matter. Um, so here's what the typical trajectory of such a particle looks like. Um, it starts out somewhere, then it gets reflected off the bubble wall a number of times. The bubble shrinks as this happens. So each of these concentric circles here indicates the position of the bubble wall at upon reflection. And then eventually it ends up here inside uh, the forming black hole. So why doesn't it annihilate? That's just, a, that's just a choice of parameters. So we just assume that uh, uh, the Yukawa coupling is sufficiently small that it doesn't annihilate. But it will grow in densities, right? So at some point, annihilation. Yeah, will, so will in, be... in, in the results I'm going to show you, we do take into account annihilation, of course. And um, and this is. Uh, probably the, the last or next to last plot that I want to show. So this is the behavior of these shrinking bubbles of false vacuum that we find once again after long and elaborate solving of, of uh, uh, large systems of Boltzmann equations. So the horizontal axis here is the radius of this shrinking bubble relative to the Hubble radius 
at the start of our simulation. Um, we are going to talk about the large numbers on this axis in a moment. And the vertical axis is the particle number density inside the bubble relative to the equilibrium density. So we start out with the equilibrium density and then for two sets of parameters that I'm showing here, we see that the density increases, increases, increases until at some point the Schwarzschild criteria is satisfied and a black hole forms. There's yes. of course also other regions of parameter space where either too many particles pass into the wall. This is the green curve here. So here you see that the growth of the density is limited just because particles are able to get into the bubble. The reason being that upon re each reflection, they pick up a little bit of momentum from the bubble wall. And if they are reflected too often, then they just gain enough energy to get in. The second possibility here is that the U Yukawa coupling is too large. If you look here at the value of the Yukawa coupling, which is in some funny units here, in order to make this plot independent of the phase transition temperature. But basically for PV scale temperatures, this means that a Yukawa coupling of order 10 to the minus five is fine. A Yukawa coupling of order 10 to the minus four is not fine. I think there was a question from Jan again. Uh, one question, yes. Uh, inside the pockets, uh, do you assume that the, the, the radiation is at thermal equilibrium? Do you assume some local thermal equilibrium? Some we, do assume, we, we do assume that inside these pockets, there is essentially thermal equilibrium, well, except for the chi over density. So chi does not have to be in thermal equilibrium because there we really track each minute momentum mode individually. Um, the other particles we assume to be in thermal equilibrium. So why don't you assume chi to be at thermal equilibrium, at least to have a defined temperature? We do not assume chi to be in thermal equilibrium. Yes, uh, why? Well, because when particles get reflected off the bubble wall, um, they gain a little bit of momentum. And at such small Yukawa couplings, um, the rate at which they re-equilibrate is relatively small. And therefore we can't assume thermal equilibrium. So what because, we do is- yeah. Because then you can increase the density without increasing the temperature. Can Sorry? You? If you don't assume local thermal equilibrium, then you can increase the density of chi without increasing its temperature. Right. Sorry, there's a little bit of an echo, so I, can't, I couldn't quite understand the second part of the question. If anyone could help me out. The problem with local thermal equilibrium is that once you start to increase the, the density, then you will increase the temperature, and then you will lose your uh, reflection criterion. Particle will not be reflected anymore. They will leave the pocket. Is it clear? Yeah, but that, that is something we do take into account. I mean, that, that, that is by tracking the individual momentum modes of chi, that effect is automatically included. Okay. Um, now, I should say that uh, this mechanism works, but only under certain conditions. So if you remember the plots from the previous uh, slide, we do need to start at relatively large bubble radii, right? We started here with a pocket that was larger than one Hubble radius even. That's not in principle a problem, but it requires an extremely, extremely slow phase transition such that uh, we, are, we are essentially nucleating on average less even than one bubble per Hubble volume. So that's already something that's not your typical phase transition. This might, for instance, require extreme supercooling again. Um, it also imposes a constraint on the strength of the phase transition because we uh, do want to have the phase transition strong enough to compress our dark matter particles. But of course, this, the dark matter particles will also exert an outward pressure. So the phase transition needs to be uh, strong enough to overcome that pressure. But simultaneously, we don't want uh, the energy difference between the true and false vacua to be so large that the universe inside uh, this shrinking bubble is inflating because that would obviously counteract uh, uh, the formation of an overdensity and therefore of a black hole. So once again, at this level, we are being agnostic about how, how precisely the potential for such a phase transition should look like. But again, supercooled phase transition may be the way to go here. 
okay, I'm going to skip the, the plot of primordial black hole parameter space because basically once you, once you accept these assumptions on the phase transition, um, it works at almost any scale. So let me just summarize by saying that phase transitions in the early universe are in my opinion, a very interesting topic and they can have rather interesting consequences to the dark matter. And yeah, those certainly deserve some further study, I think. And we're working on that. Yeah, thank you. Any further questions? Not very clear to me why you need a, a square cool phase transition. Because, for example, you referred at the beginning to a paper by Witten, I think it's the one on screen, and there there was no super cooling. Uh, so, so there actually the phase transition was in quasi equilibrium, so it was the opposite of super cooling. So, so you it, meant why I need a slow phase transition? So there is two things. One is slow, the other is super cooling. They're not the same thing. No, they are, they are not the same thing. We are just saying that super cool, super cooled phase transitions can be relatively slow. I'm not saying we need super cooling. We are just saying that super cooling might be one way to achieve the phase transition that we need. I don't think it's working. It's not working. Meaning that the phase transition, despite being first order, is in equilibrium, conserving entropy. So it takes a long time to complete, mm -hmm. many Hubble times. Yeah. But it happens in a small part as soon as you So it's not clear to me why we are not. I'm not I'm, well. I'm not saying that we need supercooling. I'm I'm just saying that supercooling might be one way, but I agree that there are other ways, of course. The, the the main requirement is we need it to be slow because what we need to avoid is that while this uh, maybe one or two Hubble-sized patch is shrinking, that another bubble pops up at the center and splits it up in two, because then um, the overdensity will be split in two, and neither of the two halves will will uh, reach the black hole formation criteria criterion. I saw there was a question on Zoom from Julian. Yes, uh, Joachim, I understood from your presentation that depending on what you assume for the annihilation cross-section, you can have filtering of primordial black holes. Is it clear that they are mutually exclusive or did you find that there can be an overlap and you can get both? You mean an overlap between where there's annihilation and where there's black holes? Uh, filtering and black holes, yes. Oh, filtering and black holes. Um... Because in a, ideally, we would like both, right? Um, the problem that I see is um, the dark matter particles that are being reflected, so the ones that do not make it into the, the true vacuum, what happens to them? Um, in order to set the correct dark matter relic abundance, um, you need to get rid of them. In order to make black holes, you need to keep as many of them as possible. So the problem with this black hole formation mechanism is um, if this is going to work, then typically, well, not every Hubble patch will contain a black hole in the end. Most Hubble patches will not, but occasionally there is one that contains a black hole and that allows us to have a black hole number density that is acceptable uh, with regard to current constraints. And then we need to think about what happens in the other Hubble patches. Yeah, well, what I had in mind is a case in which you don't want all your, black, your dark matter to be black holes, but you want just a few black holes in order to see the supermassive black holes. And if you just want to produce very few black holes, it can be interesting and maybe it's compatible with a filtering assumption. Um, yeah, I don't have an I don't have an immediate answer to that question. We we haven't really looked if the two can be made uh, to work in in the same regions of parameter space. It's something that that we need to look into. So I can't give you a a, a straightaway answer, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can discuss it. Thank you. But thanks for the question, Julia. <laughs>
so maybe going back to the first part of your uh, of your talk sure. so there was this question about uh, super cooling versus uh, having slow walls is it maybe possible to do it with in models where you have friction on the bubble walls coming from uh, this mass different so for example this transition radiation uh, uh, phenomenon where you have gauge fields that change mass yeah that's certainly one way of slowing down the bubble walls in fact in the in the uh, things that I talked about in the second part of the talk, there we specifically comment on that. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is always something that we have in the back of our minds as a way out. If you have, for instance, some extra gauge degrees of freedom that can be radiated away, that's always a way of slowing down bubble walls if you need to. Right, okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Joachim again. Thank you.